if you're going to have a school, you're going to have a group of students who are there, and people have lots of different ideas. Some want to do single-sex schools, some want to do uh, uh, Spanish immersion schools, some want to do dual language, some want to do inner city schools for people who are very underserved, some people want to do um, selective schools for people who do well on certain tests or whatever. There's a lot of different ways to select your student body. You've really got to give that some thought because that's going to be the orbit and the communication uh, and, and, and composition of your entire enterprise. Let me give you an example of what we did at High Tech High and maybe that will help you figure out how to address your own student mix issue. Okay, We knew from the history of desegregation in the United States from Plessy v. Ferguson in the 1890s where the Supreme Court said separate but equal. And then in 1954, in Brown versus Board of Education, when the Supreme Court said, together and equal, even though today we're less together and less equal than we have been, nonetheless, one could decide to be Plessy, which is separate but equal, or one could decide to be Brown, which is together and equal. We've gone the way of Brown, together and equal. So we have a zip code-based lottery, because housing segregation in most places is the cause of school segregation. So if you dress it at the root, which is housing, it's kind of an interesting process. So you've got, in the case of California, where we operate our schools, we have a law, Proposition 209, which forbids the use of race or ethnicity in selecting anybody for any public entity, college or, or school. Well, fine. We look at the census data, which is a federal number set that shows what percent of eighth graders, if we're picking through a ninth grade, reside in every zip code. And then we decide on what percent to take from that zip code. And the zip code is a five-digit number. So each of them give us cover. Two federal numbers, census data and zip code. And then we take whatever percent live in every zip code. So we land up having schools, and it's, it's non-meritocratic admissions. That's a decision that we make, and if you were to go online during our open enrollment period, you would see that the only information we have about a student is their name and their address and what grade they're applying for. Now, some people might say, well, actually, but there is a selection bias, and there is a selection bias. There's a selection bias in any school that you're creating because some people apply and some people don't. Unless you're a, dist a district school in which everyone who lives in that area just comes in, how do you mediate against the selection bias? One way to do it is by going out to churches, going out to middle schools for high school, and have kids from your existing school, if you already have one, showing some of the work that they're doing to their counterparts who live in the neighborhoods that they come from, and sharing that information so that kids feel like, oh, this could be me. It's a basic proposition that you're really offering kids when you're opening school and you're wanting them to sort of do well is, yes, this could be you. This could be you in this school thriving and doing these types of things that this school has. We will put to further conversations how the faculty get there and what the pedagogical mix is, but give some serious thought to who you want your student body mm -hmm. to be, ideally picture that, and then what is the path that is going to get you the student body that you want. And remember, um, you don't always get what you're intending to get. So really be very thoughtful about how you're going to get the student mix that you truly would like to